All right, let's read. Three, two, one, read. The days drew near for him to be taken up. He set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, would you speak to us today through your word and through your spirit? Would you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive it? Or would you fill us with certainty? Or would you stir within us a growing desire and a conviction to know you and to make you known? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So here in in chapter 9, verse 51, we've we've reached a major turning point in Luke's gospel. We're entering act two of this great account of the life and the ministry of Jesus. And verse 51 sets the scene for us. We just read it. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he, talking about Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now the next 10 chapters, all the way through chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus is on the road with his disciples, a road that will lead to Jerusalem where all that was written about him in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms was to be accomplished. To fully understand our passage this morning and really the chapters that that are ahead, we need to feel the weight of the shift in this narrative. We need to get a solid grasp on on why Jesus' face is set to go to Jerusalem, what is waiting for him when he gets there. And I think when we do that, I think we'll see that in our passage today and in the chapters moving forward, Luke, the author, is placing a really high emphasis on having a proper focus in regards to who Jesus is and his kingdom, the kingdom of God. And what this Luke is arguing from our passage today is that for us to live fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus, our focus must be in light of his kingdom. Our focus must be in light of the kingdom of God, both already the here and the now, and in light of the fullness of the kingdom that is to come. You see, in our passage this morning, it's bookended by comments about focus and in gaze. Verse 51, it says that Jesus' face was set to go to Jerusalem. His focus is there. His gaze is there. He'll say later in chapter 13 that he must go. You see, it was for this purpose that Jesus came. And although he knew all that was to take place when he arrived, nothing would stop him. His face was set. Divine grit marks these chapters of Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. But notice also that our passage today ends with Jesus commenting on a potential potential follower's lack of focus. He says, no one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so I ask you, What has your focus and what has captured your gaze? You see, the contrast is there for us in these verses. Jesus' face was set on fulfilling the Father's kingdom work. But this would-be follower's gaze was being pulled elsewhere. They were looking back. Their face was not set forward. They failed to see his kingdom. And they failed to see the king. And they failed to see the urgency of his calling. His willingness to follow was not in light of the kingdom. And we're going to get into all this a little bit more as we continue, but I wanted us to see from the beginning that when our focus is not in light of the kingdom, we miss who Jesus is, what he is doing, 
and we fail to see the urgency of his mission and his message. Now, when when I refer to the kingdom of God, which is a major theme throughout the Gospel of Luke, we're referring to Christ's present and future reign over all things. We're recognizing that what we see here and now is, is not the whole picture, and it's not the end of the story, but that through the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, his kingdom has come, and his kingdom is extending to all people of all nations as he rules and he reigns with all wisdom and with all power and with all authority at the right hand of God. And when we say that we are to live in light of the kingdom, I'm referring also to the fact, and we've mentioned it already today, that Christ will come again. And so it is with this urgency that we as his follower live our lives with these greater realities impressed on our hearts and at the forefront of our minds. To live in light of the kingdom means that we allow the kingdom to shape our choices We allow the kingdom to shape the commitments we commit to, and we allow the kingdom to inform our priorities. So as we continue in our passage, consider the implications of the lessons along the road that Jesus has for his disciples. Let's keep these things in our minds. As we get back to the text, Jerusalem is now looming large in Jesus' mind. His face is set, and he and his disciples begin their southward journey. Jesus has already told his disciples on two separate occasions the purpose of his going to Jerusalem. In chapter 9, verse 22, he told them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day he would rise. And again, in verse 44 of chapter 9, he tells them that the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Between these verses, we have that powerful record of the transfiguration when Jesus, clothed in in fully white and and dazzling white and full of glory, appears and, and along with Peter and James and John, and they're visited by Moses and Elijah, who are representatives of the law and the prophets. And they speak of Jesus' departure. And Luke's gospel adds the things that he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. You see, all things are pointing us to Jerusalem. If Jesus, the Christ of God, is going to be rejected and killed as the prophets had foretold, it was going to be in Jerusalem, the city he would soon lament over as the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. It was there, as he told his disciples, Jesus would also rise from the dead, defeating sin and death and ascend to his rightful place. And this will have great impact as we consider the urgency of his calling and of his kingdom. And though they they were told ahead of time, these disciples did not yet understand. It said these things were hidden from their minds. They were not able to perceive it. And I love that choice of the word that Luke uses there, that, that they could not perceive it. As we talk about focus and we talk about gaze, they could not see clearly. They could not perceive the sayings that Jesus was telling them. But we'll find out later that their eyes would indeed be open to perceive clearly the words of Jesus. And how the, all the events that unfolded in Jerusalem fulfilled all that was written about him. Such revelation would lead them to go and proclaim this good news to the nations. But these disciples, they're not there yet. Their thoughts are on the Son of Man filled with that divine grit and purpose in every step. With laser-like focus in his eyes and they're thinking, this is it. Maybe the word of the Lord that came to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 21 begins to flood their mind. It says, Son of man, set your face towards Jerusalem. And what follows in that passage is judgment. There's preaching and prophesying against it. There's a sword that is drawn from its sheath, and it says that will not be sheathed again. James and John, rightly nicknamed the sons of thunder, were all about it. Let's continue reading. Verse 52. And he, again Jesus, sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. The translation here is literally that Jesus sent messengers before his face. It's the same wording, the same phrase that is spoken of John the Baptist, that great prophet who would go before his face to prepare the way for Jesus. And now Jesus is sending these disciples, these messengers ahead of him. And this isn't the first, and it won't be the last time, that Jesus sends disciples into villages. In fact, he gave them very clear instruction on what to do when they entered these villages. Instructions that included what to do if they were received well, and instructions on what they were to do if they were rejected. 
we get a glimpse of how well these sons of thunder listened. Verse 53, but the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? James and John were ready to go full Elijah on them and call down fire from heaven. In case you're wondering, this was not what Jesus' instructions were. The instructions Jesus gave them were to simply shake the dust off their feet. It was a testimony against that city of their rejection of the Christ and of his kingdom. Jesus would add in chapter 10 that even if they reject you, you can be certain that you can know that the kingdom has come. That you can know that it will be more bearable on that day, the day of judgment for Sodom, where brimstone and fire actually did rain down than on that town. But these guys were ready to bring the judgment right here and right now. You see, their focus was wrong. Perhaps riding high from being given power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases at the beginning of chapter 9, a power that was meant to accompany the proclamation of the kingdom, James and John's focus was on their power and on their authority instead of the kingdom Jesus was establishing, a kingdom that they themselves had been witnesses of. Kent Hughes notes in his commentary that in their rush to call for God's judgment, they had chosen to ignore Jesus' example and teaching. James and John would have been among those who heard Jesus' words in, in chapter 6 when he said, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. They would have heard the words that Glenn highlighted for us a couple weeks ago when he said, Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Indeed, the ethic of the kingdom was mercy. And they had seen Jesus' life reflect this in a thousand different ways. And so when Jesus turns and rebukes it, it's a totally normal and appropriate response to their actions. You see, following Jesus, being fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus, means we do so in light of the kingdom. Here, James and John missed it. And it reminds me of a, another time when Jesus rebuked a disciple, when he turned and he rebuked Peter. And do you remember why he rebuked Peter? Scripture tells us it was because his mind was not set on the things of God, but on the things of man. He missed it. Peter's response, much like the two disciples in our passage, reflects that he was failing to see the greater kingdom purposes at hand. Interestingly enough, both rebukes come right after the confession that Jesus is the Christ and shortly after Jesus tells of his rejection, of his suffering, of his death, and of his resurrection. You see, when our focus is not in light of the kingdom, we miss who Jesus is. We miss what he is doing. And we fail to see the urgency of his mission and his message. Now, the Samaritan village missed it as well. But we're given the reason why they did not receive him. Verse 53 tells us, says, But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And so a little cultural context is, is helpful here. If you've sat in church for any amount of time, you've probably heard that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along very well. And that's true, but man, that chasm was really deep. Let me just share what I've, what I've learned this week uh, studying this passage and, and learning a little bit more about this division between the Jews and the Samaritans. Because I think when we, when we look at it and we consider the weight of it, we see, one, why this rejection wasn't surprising at all. And two, we also see the beauty of Christ to reconcile people of all nations for his glory. So concerning the Jews and the Samaritans, the mutual hatred between them went back for centuries when the Samaritans intermarried with their Assyrian conquerors. The Jews considered them to be half-breeds and religious apostates. The Samaritans responded in kind by calling the Jews apostates, full-blooded but apostate nonetheless. The Samaritans went on to set up a rival temple on the Mount of Gerizim, which was later destroyed by the Jews. But the separation goes even deeper than just the location of the temple. You see, the Samaritans published their own edition of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, the, the words that Moses had, had written, and established a rival liturgy. The Jews responded 
by publicly cursing the Samaritans in the synagogue and praying daily that they might not enter eternal life. So to say they didn't get along is quite the understatement. There's even an account uh, during the New Testament times when some Samaritans were able to sneak their way into the temple in Jerusalem and, and they scattered human bones. And it's said that the action made both the Jews and the Samaritans, and I quote, regret that life was so short because there was so much to hate and so little time. As I said, the chasm was deep. So bringing it back to our passage, when, when we see that this Samaritan village rejected Jesus, that they did not receive him because his face was set to Jerusalem, which was the epicenter of, of Jewish life, of Jewish culture, of Jewish worship, it wasn't necessarily a rejection of Jesus personally or rejection of him as God's anointed one, but yet another rejection in that back and forth of hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. And yet still, for James and John and for this Samaritan village, they were so caught up in their mutual disdain for one another that everyone missed the kingdom that Jesus had come to proclaim, the kingdom that he was currently establishing, the kingdom that will be made up of Jews and Samaritans alike. As Jesus told the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, that the hour was coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, not exclusively in Jerusalem, on, or on a mountain, the hour was now here. The kingdom was at hand. Jesus, the very prince of peace, the, the great reconciler, the hope of the nations was in their midst, and they missed it. You see, when our focus is not in light of the kingdom, we miss who Jesus is, what he is doing, and we fail to see the urgency of his mission and his message. And so with no fire called down from heaven, no judgment dealt out or tensions escalated, Jesus and his disciples simply proceed to another village. And along the way, we're brought into three interactions between Jesus and a few potential would-be followers. These three conversations help us to continue adjusting our focus on what it means to follow Jesus and the urgency of his mission and his message. It will help us see more clearly that to live fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus, our focus too must be in light of his kingdom. Take a look at verses 57 through 61 again. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 59, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus gives us three seemingly radical statements about the commitment and the demands of following him. At first read, you might be thinking that Jesus is discouraging people from, him, from following him, as if the team is already picked and the roster spots are all full. But notice in verse 59, it's, it's Jesus initiating it. It's Jesus extending the invitation to follow me. So what is Jesus teaching us about following him in light of the kingdom? I think, again, we need to keep in mind the context. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where he will be betrayed, where he's going to be rejected, nailed on a cross and die, where he'll be placed in a tomb, raised to life, and then ascend again. Consider also what he's already revealed regarding the requirements of following him. This is where I wish we were preaching all the way through, because we didn't have time to really dig into this passage. But in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits himself? And as he continued in his ministry and the crowds began to follow him, Jesus would later emphasize the importance of counting the cost before making the commitment. He would say to them that anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
In our passage today, our our first would-be follower shows great willingness. I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. Oh, but Jesus knew that following him wasn't going to be easy. And that such a a blithe or an easily spoken declaration of commitment would never make it along the road. The first would-be follower had not considered first the cost of following Jesus. He had failed to consider that that hardships and discomfort and even uncertainty would be part of this commitment if he was to be fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus. It's worth noting that at times before and after this interaction, Jesus did, in fact, have a place to lay his head. And the instructions that he gave his followers when he sent them out was to, to stay in a place and eat with those who would welcome them. But it's worth noting also that there have been and there will be many a time throughout history when those who follow Jesus do in fact experience homelessness and undergo immense discomfort, persecution, and even be put to death. So what is Jesus saying? I think with this statement, as he so often does, Jesus is pointing us to a greater principle. I think he's pointing us to, to realize that to follow Jesus in light of the kingdom means that you will have an ever-growing sense that this world is not your home. As you live fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus, there will be dissonance and there will be discomfort. There will be unease and there will be rejection. This is what we see in the life of Jesus as he had his face fixed towards accomplishing all that he came to accomplish, as he set out to accomplish the Father's plan of salvation. And so we too, as the would-be followers of Jesus, must consider these things and embrace a discomfort with this world that has forsaken its true king. One author said it this way, A committed heart knows the discomfort of loving difficult people, the discomfort of giving until it hurts, the discomfort of putting oneself out for the ministry of Christ and his church, the discomfort of a life out of step with modern culture, being disliked in the occasional sense of having nowhere to lay your head, But Christ's reward far outvalues anything lost by following him. Christian, if you are feeling that discomfort right now on account of Christ, be encouraged. You are living in light of the kingdom. Be encouraged. Your heavenly Father is pleased. Your sacrifices are not in vain. Your rejection has not gone unnoticed. Your tears and your longings are seen and they are known. Take heart. It is worth it all. Continue keeping your eyes and your focus on Christ, who is your great reward. For he will come again, and he will make all things new. And this is part of living in light of the kingdom. For now we see in part, but on that day we will see clearly the goodness, the righteousness, the justice, and the kindness of the Lord. And for all of us, as the hymn says, may the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. May we embrace the dissonance of being in the world, but not of it, as we live in light of the kingdom. But there's still more in this passage. We have two other interactions this morning that further highlight the urgency of following Jesus in light of his kingdom. In verse 59, Jesus initiates the invitation to follow him. And in verse 61, another potential follower expresses his willingness to follow Jesus. However, it seems that both have higher priorities. It seems that both have a divided focus. Notice their statements. Let me first go and bury my father. Let me first say farewell. And Jesus responds to both of them by pointing to the kingdom of God. And again, some cultural context is helpful here so we don't miss what the words of Jesus are saying and we don't miss what the words of Jesus are not saying. To the one who responded to Jesus' invitation with, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. It would seem as if Jesus' words are, at the very least, quite harsh, rude, insensitive, probably offensive. And at worst, they're in direct opposition to both the commandment given by God himself to Moses to honor your father and mother and also hypocritical to his own teaching as he rebuked and rejected the religious leaders who were in the practice of withholding help from their aging parents under the pretense of what they would have given to their parents was given to God instead. Jesus strongly rejected and condemned this practice. 
You see, in reference to honoring parents in their death, the rabbis of that day had created a mass of protective measures around it. They had made it such that, that burial was considered a religious duty that took precedence over all things, including the study of the law. Their instructions are recorded and read, He who is confronted by a dead relative is freed from reciting the Shema, from the 18 benedictions, and from all the commandments stated in the Torah. According to the tradition of the rabbis, to assist in the burial of even a non-relative was a work that received great reward from God, and that the burial of a father was a religious duty of utmost importance. So Jesus' response would have been quite shocking. But you see, something greater was here. Something more pressing, something more urgent was at stake. As for you, follow me and go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You might notice also that this man is on the road with Jesus. He's not by his father's bedside, mourning the loss with his family. So most likely, this, this guy's dad hadn't even died yet. And uh, perhaps his father was elderly, you know, maybe. And he wanted to go home and be with him until after he, he passed away and after all the, the burial rituals were, were complete, which could take up to a year, uh, whenever that would be. And then he would follow Jesus. But such statements reveal that he failed to recognize the urgency and the importance of the task that Jesus was calling him to. And as we've seen throughout this passage, he too had a wrong focus. And so I'll say it again. When our focus is not in light of the kingdom, we miss who Jesus is, what he is doing, and we fail to see the urgency of his mission and his message. Jesus' statements highlight for us the importance and the urgency of his call to follow him and of the message of the kingdom. And to the ones in verse 61 and 62 who request first to go home and say his farewells, Jesus responds again with a call for urgency and right focus. He says, no one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The image that, that Jesus paints here brings Elijah back into the picture. You see, back in 1 Kings chapter 19, the prophet Elijah, under the instruction from the Lord, goes to Elisha, and help me keep track of these names, all right? So Elijah, under the instruction of the Lord, is going to Elisha to anoint him as the next prophet. He's going there to, to call him, to follow him, and to learn from him, and eventually take over as the appointed voice of the Lord to the people. When he arrives, guess what Elisha is doing? He's in the field plowing. He leaves the plow and the oxen and has just one request before he follows Elijah. See if this sounds familiar. Let me first kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. In other words, he wants to say his farewells. Elijah, unlike Jesus in our passage, allows him to go. And so the author is wanting us to ask and to consider what's changed. What's different about the ministry of this great prophet Elijah and what's different about the ministry that Jesus is doing currently, that Jesus wouldn't allow his followers to first go back and say their farewells? You see, with the coming of Jesus, something, someone greater than Elijah was here. Matthew's gospel account comments that many prophets and righteous people of that day longed to see the days of Jesus, to see what they were seeing and to hear what they were now hearing. Elijah and the prophets before him spoke and foretold of a king and a kingdom that was to come, and now the king and his kingdom was at hand. Someone greater than the prophets had come. And now seeing a fuller picture, there's more urgency to the calling, to the mission, and to the message. Jesus wants his followers and his potential followers to recognize that. And Luke writes these things so that we as the readers might see these things as well. Now, I have a confession. I have never plowed a field with oxen. It's true, I've never done it. I don't know how easy or difficult it is, but I can understand that if I am moving forward and I am looking backwards, it's not going to end well. I'm going to run into something, I'm going to crash into something, I'm going to stumble and fall, and I'm certainly not going to keep a straight line. You see, Jesus knows that when our focus is on what we've left behind to follow him. And we dream about the life that might have been, 
maybe easier in some ways by earthly standards, we will not do well on the road to following him. Because to live fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus, our focus must be in light of the kingdom. When we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him, we set our faces and we fix our gaze to go where he is headed, to be a part of what he is doing, and to go about the work of the kingdom. Now let me just say a brief word about what this passage is not saying. Because sadly, many have taken these words of Jesus and twisted them and used them as an excuse to neglect family and to neglect responsibility. But hear me clearly, this is not what Jesus is saying. These words were never given as a license to abandon. This passage is all about coming to Jesus, where we find salvation and we find new life in Him, where we find a new way of living, reorienting our lives in light of Him, in light of the grace and the mercy of the gospel, that if we would just look to Him, we would see it clearly. And then going with joy and with urgency to proclaim this good news, bringing as many with us as we can. So far from leaving behind those he's entrusted in our care, he urges you and me to follow him, to lead our families and to lead those around us into a greater and growing love for Jesus and a greater and growing surrender of the things that so easily entangle us as we seek to run this race well. Hands on the plow, fixing our eyes on him and persevering to the end. Let me say also that this passage brings up the responsibilities of, of caring well for aging parents and end-of-life care. And I know that many in our congregation are currently navigating what this looks like. And let me first just encourage you. The work that you are doing is a good work. It's a difficult and it's a hard work, but it is a good work. And I pray that today, even today, you would be strengthened by the Lord, that he would strengthen your weary hands, that he would strengthen your weary hearts. Pray that his love would abound in you so that with the love of God and Christ Jesus being poured into you, you would be able to pour it out on those that you care for. And I pray that you'd be filled with wisdom and that you would walk in his peace, that you would continually receive the grace and the mercy of God as you care well for your loved ones. I'd also encourage you to consider what does it look like to live in light of the kingdom in this season and not view this kingdom work as something separate than the work that you are already doing. You see, there is a way for us to follow Jesus in these seasons and to live in light of the kingdom in these seasons right here and right now where he has you and with the task at hand. What would it look like for you to bring the principles of the kingdom, the gentleness of Christ, his kindness, his mercy, the grace and the patience of the Lord, what would it look like to bring those to your aging parent? How might you live these out, not only as you care for your loved ones, but also as you interact with family members that I know at many times probably don't see things the same way you do, for caretakers and for doctors? How might you bring the good news of this message both in word and deed into these places? And know that as you do, that the Lord is pleased with you. Know that as you do, his kingdom has come. And know that as you do, there is more going on than what we currently see. Now this applies to, to all of us, not just those taking care of aging parents. And so be encouraged, church. It is for this purpose that we have been gifted the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. And it is for this purpose that we have been gifted one another. You are not alone in this work. You are not alone in this pursuit of following Christ in light of the kingdom. There are many in this room who want to come alongside you as you follow Jesus. In church, the gospel is good news. We need to keep it in front of ourselves constantly. We need to keep it before one another in all seasons of life. Seasons change. But the word of the Lord and his kingdom endures forever and ever. You see, we've seen in our passage today that Jesus' face was set to go to Jerusalem. The days drew near for him to be taken up, both on the cross and when all was accomplished, taken up to sit at the right hand of the Father in glory. 
the divine grit that marks these chapters led to the cross. The judgment for those who rejected God's anointed one did come. Not from fire from heaven like James and John wanted, but it was poured out and it fell on Jesus there at the cross. There he died. He was buried and rose again. And just as he said, after many saw the resurrected Christ, he was taken up and he promised he would return. And you see, church, this is where the urgency of following Jesus and living in light of the kingdom comes in. When the Son of Man returns, it says he will come with judgment. It says that he will judge both the living and the dead. His face is set towards that day. And I think sometimes we shy away from these things. But this passage this morning demands that we consider Christ's current rule and reign as the ascended Lord, his second coming. And it demands that we respond with an urgency that matches the, met the message. And so, as we close this morning, I want us to notice two more things from the three interactions we read. These three would-be followers, you might have noticed, they're not given names, and we're not told how they responded. I believe this is intentional. I think it's the author's way of wanting us to put ourselves in their positions. And when we do, I think it leads us to consider three things that, at least three things, probably many more, that I want us to, to prayerfully consider and reflect on this week. From the first would-be follower, have you truly considered and counted the cost of being fully engaged in the life and the message of Jesus? Have you started out maybe saying, I'll follow you wherever you go, but failed to consider whether or not you're willing to embrace a life of discomfort? with this world and live fully engaged in the life and the mission of Jesus. Even if it means there will be that dissonance, that unease and that rejection from the world. From the second potential follower, it leads us to consider our, our own. I will follow you, but first, how would you fill in the blank? It leads us to consider those statements. Maybe another way to consider that is to ask the question I posed at the beginning. What has your focus? What has captured your gaze? And from the third would-be follower, we need to ask, do I have a divided focus between Christ and his kingdom and our many commitments and the countless opportunities that are presented to us each and every day? Is our focus pulled in too many directions? Has our running straight with our hands on the plow turned into a dizzying mix of zigs and zags where we don't even know where we're going? Church, will we allow Christ and his all-encompassing an ever-extending rule and reign to set the priorities straight in our lives and in the choices we make. Choices and commitments that might not be the easiest, probably not the most convenient, probably not the most comfortable, but would actually be far more fruitful and more life-giving in light of the kingdom. Let me encourage you not to dismiss those questions too quickly. Bring them to the Lord. Ask Him to search your heart. Ask him to help you as you seek first his kingdom. I'd also encourage you to bring someone in to walk with you through these things. So when our focus is not in light of the kingdom, we miss who Jesus is, what he is doing, and we fail to see the urgency of his mission and his message. But when our focus is on Jesus, and we do see him rightly as that crucified, risen, ascended, returning Lord. And we count the cost and we choose to follow him and we live our lives in light of the kingdom. We have the joy and the privilege of seeing and knowing and participating in what he is doing and where he is heading and how his glory is being revealed even now among the nations. We will eagerly and with certainty and with much joy, like those who are being baptized today, respond to the urgency of his mission and his message. May Christ be praised now and forevermore. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for strong passages that call us to consider where we stand, that call us to consider things not from our own lives, but in light of the kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with a divine grit to live in light of the kingdom, whatever may come our way. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen weary hands again.
that you would encourage our hearts, Lord, that we would come alongside and link arms with one another and go after this with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all our minds, and with all our strength. Lord, we thank you that you are worthy of it all. Whatever cost we think it it might be to follow you, Lord, you are worthy of it all. Would you convince us today again? Would you show us who you are again today, Lord, that we would run this race well, that we would fix our eyes on you. No turning back. No turning back. And bringing as many with us as we can. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. At this time we're